talk to you just a little bit about our, our prayer Bible. Well, we got people's name in here that sent us in letters or have written their name in here, and we don't have anything about what they need. It is just a book for us to pray over because they know what they need, and Lord have mercy, the good Lord knows what every one of us needs. And their needs change daily. But he knows that too. Isn't that wonderful that we have a God that knows everything, every little single solitary good and bad things. And this is where they have written us and sent in them their names. And we pray over this book. Golly, probably, we probably pray, I'll pray uh, some of us pray, pray all, seven times a week. But we're doing every time we have our church, we pray over it. When we have Bible study, both Bible studies, we pray over it. And some of us just pray on it no matter what. When we're praying, we just include it. And your name can be in here. If you will send your name in here and a good address, Pastor Woody will send you this little decal that I love on my car. And even on my new car, it's getting cold. I'm going to have to get me another one. But it says, it's Rock and Country Church is praying for me. And we may be a little church out in the boonies, but let me tell you what, we pray. And, and I know that God hears our, he says, if two or more are gathered together, he would be there too. And you know, that's when you pray for God. You're one and he, he's one and you're two. And so he listens and, and we are so grateful to have a loving God that does that. So if you'll go to one more time, we're going to church before, uh, we're going to pray. And then Woody's going to pray one more time before he preaches. We pray, we pray a lot. So if gentlemen, if you'll take your hats off, we'll go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to have such a wonderful Father. Father, we just can't say how much we appreciate the love that you give us and the things that you give us. And even when we don't ask, but Lord, we know that when we come together to, to pray for you, that you hear our prayer. Lord, you ask, we ask that you lift up Woody and let his sermon be one that will touch our hearts today, Lord, and will touch our hearts again. And let us be one that we want to go home and look back in our in our Bible and see what we might have missed so that we can say, hey, I need to talk to you about this because I missed it. Maybe it's not what, what Woody had said, but maybe we missed it. And Father, we ask that you, in the Bible it says that just you're not ever supposed to ask for him to do something more. But Lord, you say that we can pray, that we can give to him and everything's great. And it works wonders. And Lord, so we lift up for everybody that, um, that tithes with us. And you don't have to tithe with us. It's whatever you can put in the tithe with. We just give you the praise and the glory for letting people do this. Father, we thank you for everything that you give us. We thank you for this day, which is going to be a beautiful day. And Lord, we ask that you just bless us in this year to come. And we just will give you all the praise and the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. Whoop. Trying to get it all together this brand new year. Amen. Well, good morning, Rockin' Country Church. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Now, you better count your blessings because I was going to be singing today if I hadn't gotten a hold of uh, Beverly. I mean, uh, <laughs> Heather, I'm sorry. If I, I looked over at Beverly and I, her name just stuck in my head. Uh, I hadn't gotten a hold of Heather. Uh, Y'all would have had me up here singing this morning, and that you don't want. So uh, thank you, Heather, for such an awesome, awesome uh, uh, praise this morning. And we look forward to you being here again and again and again and again. And we want to also lift up her husband, Bill. Uh, he has some health issues uh, that we need to uh, lift up to the Lord. So with that, uh, we're not going to have children's church this morning. I know we've got one big guy back there. But uh, Miss Terry says she wants to be in here today. So uh, number 11 could go, I guess, you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, it's going to be a great, great, great year for this church and for God's kingdom. Amen. God's going to use this church in order to build his kingdom. And I look forward to everything that he wants to do and being obedient to him and doing whatever he tells us and however he directs us in our lives so that he may be glorified through our lives uh, looking forward to it it's uh, i said last year that it was going to be a good year last year it was 
This church uh, did a lot of things last year to uh, for God's kingdom, and it's going to be a better year this year. And I'm looking forward to more and more and more years. Now, I know a lot of you wonder, well, this is not the third week of the second month of each quarter to do the Lord's Supper. Well, the Lord put it on my heart uh, yesterday or day before, whenever it was, that we're going to uh, uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper today. And you'll see, and I'll direct it as we go along, you'll see in our message today as to why and when we're going to do it, okay? So don't worry about it. Just let, has anybody not got their elements? Did anybody not get one? So we want to make sure that you have one. All right? Well, with that, let's go ahead and pray up our teaching today, and we will get started. Uh, our scriptures are right there. 51 again. We have 51 every week. Every week it's 51. What is, oh well, somebody better bring somebody next week so we'll have 52, okay? But, but anyway, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer because we are a praying church and then we'll get started on with our teaching, okay? Father God, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for the message that you have given me today, Lord. I ask you to, uh, to open up our hearts, minds, souls, and spirits to receive this word today, Lord, because it comes from you, only you, and we give you all the glory and praise for it, Lord, because it's your message. It's not mine, nor, nor do I want it to ever be mine. Let me step aside. Use me as your tool, as your vessel, Lord, in order to bring forth the word, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. It is all about him. It's all about him, Lord. So again, Lord, I ask you to, to lift up everybody here, everybody who is watching and let us behold the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> All right. Now I'm going to, oh, thank you. I forget that. All right, I'm going to uh, preach a little bit. And then I'm going to teach a little bit. Just a little bit. Actually, we're going to preach a lot. And we're going to talk a lot and teach a lot. So you can open your Bibles to uh, the book of Acts, which is right after the Gospel of John. But as many of you know, and many of you have already suspected in your hearts, well, I know we're not going to be there. And you're right, we're not. We're going to go elsewhere. But we're going to end up there. So put your marker there and just get ready to move on. All right? Move on through the Word. But I want to talk to you a little bit. I think each and every one of us can sympathize with Peter somewhat. For we may have been able to see ourselves in some of his actions. I taught on this a little while back. And I, I look at Peter and the life of Peter with Christ. And I see myself in so, so many different places in Peter's life as he walked with Christ. Some I'm not happy with, some I am very happy with. Such as when Jesus, or when he said to the Lord Jesus, he says, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. You remember that? That's in Matthew 26, 35. Don't go there. Just notate, Matthew 26, 35. He said, Lord, even if I have to die with you, even if it means death for me, I'll never deny you. Ooh, never say never, right? All right. Because we know, we know that Peter denied Christ. And what really strikes me a lot of times is whenever I realize that for some way, somehow, some reason I have denied Christ a little bit. I remember over in Luke 22, 61 through 62, were in the courtyard after his denial. The eyes of Jesus met the eyes of Peter. And Peter realized what he had done. And in scripture says he went out and wept bitterly. Now what that scripture tells me is, is that if I want to feel good about myself, I need not deny my Lord, right? I need not deny my Lord. 
But sometimes I do. Maybe not intentionally. Each day, in some way, we may deny Christ. Each and every one of us may deny Christ. Even for a moment, while we're fighting the battles that we fight in this wicked, fallen world that we live in, are we conscious of God being with us? Sometimes we may deny him by not praying as we should pray, not studying as we should study, not going to church as we should go to church, or just in our minds we may deny him as we live our life. God's desire is to be with you daily throughout the day, being involved in all things, all things that you're involved in. It doesn't matter what it is. Lord, what boots should I wear today? Lord, should I get co coffee for uh, Terry or should I, should I not? Lord, what do I need to do? What, what is next? What shirt shall I wear? Now, I use that as a kind of a, uh, as a, as a, uh, an example, but the little things God wants to be involved in in their lives. It's the big things as well. Boy, if something big comes along, we're right there. Lord, where are you? Come on, help me out here. Save me, right? But what about the little things? Do you know God helped uh, Heather choose the songs that she chose today? She didn't do it. God did it for her. And boy, they were great, were they not? They were awesome. And I'm still going to find that one song that I heard the other day that I dearly loved. And I thought, man, that was an awesome song. So I'm going I'm to write you a letter or whatever it takes to get that song. I hope it's on your new CD because we're going to get one. But God wants to be involved in every aspect of your day-to-day -day being, of your very existence. Why? Because he loves you, that's why. Because he is a good, good father. And he loves you, and he simply wants to be with you. We just finished our Christmas season. And we just received, if you will, the message of the one thing that God gave us as a I'm going to use this lightly, if you will, as a Christmas gift. One thing more valuable than gold and silver, all the jewels in the world, more valuable than life itself. He gave us the gift of a baby, of a little baby who became our Savior, who was our Savior, who is our Savior. Emmanuel, God with us. A gift to mankind. The child, the Christ child, our Lord Jesus. And all through Jesus' short ministry, do you know his ministry was only three and a half years? It wasn't 33 and a half years. It was three and a half years. And all through that ministry, whenever he called, whenever he chose his disciples, each and every day, with the exception of his private time with God in prayer, each and every day he spent with his guys. All 24 hours a day, seven days a week for three and a half years. Except whenever he needed time to be with the Father himself. He said, wait here, I go to pray. So see, each of us need time with God. Jesus was never without God. And we need not ever be without God. We should never be without God. God never wants to not be with you. And remember, God is always with you. No matter what you're doing, no matter where you're at, there's somebody there watching. You're never alone. He says, I will never leave you, right? So he's there. 
We need to be conscious of that. God wants to be with you all the time. Not just sometimes. Not when you're going through the tough things does God want to be there. He wants to be there when you're going through the simplest things. For three and a half years, he walked with his disciples daily, every day. Every day. He spent this time with his followers, his fellow believers. Those that the Father had called. Now, why do I say those that the Father has called? Because I hope you understand, we just studied this over in Romans 8. God predestined who he would pour out his love on. And those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he will glorify. And we talked about this uh, on Wednesday night. So you are not here because, oh, well, I guess I ought to go to church and give it a shot, right? Nothing else is working in my life. No, you're here because God has called you here. That's the reason you're here. Those of you who are watching on TV this message today or watching on your computer or your iPhone, and I know there's many of you because Terry and I up front, we kind of kind of oversee things and, and we see who is, you know, online making sure that it's going out, all that kind of thing. And, and we, there's several people that are watching online. There's several people that will come back and view it later on. There's many, many people that are not here today that are, that are generally here. There's some people sitting in their lounge chair at home or on their couch going, what did he say? And so this message today, in my heart, I feel as though the Lord is kind of, this message is for those people. It's for you and I as well, but it is for those people. And we're going to kind of talk in, in depth of why those people are there and we are here. Now, I'm not talking about people who can't get here because of health reasons, because of financial reasons, because of distance, whatever, whatever. I'm talking about the people who are sitting at home because they just didn't feel up to getting up and getting dressed and going to church. Now, in this church here, we don't require a suit and tie. We don't require women in dresses. You do have to wear clothes, all right? We do require clothes. But if you clothe yourself, you're welcome to come on. I mean, I don't care if you come in short pants and, and uh flip-flops and a, and a tank top or t-shirt or whatever you call it uh, just come to worship with us always remember now you're supposed to give God your best as best you can we don't judge anybody because their best is not our best okay we're not anyone's judge but you do have to wear clothes that is a requirement okay but we're in a new year and I pray that this new year, we who are the called, you would not be here, you would not be watching, you would not be tuning in if you were not called by God. We who are the called will have a new desire to spend more time with God each day. Not just on Sunday. We come here and we give God two hours. Two hours in a seven-day week. That has 24 hours in the day. What if God gave you two hours of him each week? Oh, well, you're in deep uh, trouble there, buddy. Well, sorry, your two hours has already been used up. You'll have to wait till next week. Hope you make it. That's not what God does. He's there. He's right there with you. But yet, oh, I got to get up and go to church today. No, you don't have to do anything. But I get to go to church, don't we, Brother Johnny? I get to go to church. I am blessed to be able to come to church. Not because I do what I do here, but because I'm, I can be here with you. And I can worship our, our risen Lord and Savior with you. That's why I'm blessed. Because I can come here and receive the blessings. We're going to talk about that today. We had most of our kids down yesterday because we do our, 
our Christmas, if you will, because our kids have kids and other families and all that. So they have Christmas, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And then the Saturday after, they all come down to our house and we do our Christmas. And we had a great time yesterday. I, I told several of you this because I thought it was so funny. My grandson, who is fixing to be nine years old, there was so much junk in our house. So, uh, so much junk in our house. And candies and sweets and cakes and pies and all this other stuff. And I was talking with one of my grandsons and I says, hey, I, I don't remember the candy. I was going, I think it was the Reese's. I got, I got another 12 pack of Reese's. Man, I got Reese's on my ears, which I love. I got no problem with that. Number one candy bar in the whole United States. Got no problem with it. But anyway, I think it was, I think that's what it was. And I told Maxie, I said, Maxie, do you want one of these? And he goes, Papa, by the time I leave here, I'm going to have diabetes. Because <laughs> there's so much junk in our house. That, but we had a great, great time. But you know what the big, and we exchanged gifts and all that stuff. But you know what, and we ate. Oh, boy, did we ever eat. It was good. Thank you, Terry, for all you did. You'd put on a, a good feed yesterday. But of all the stuff, the greatest gift was having my kids and grandkids there. That was the greatest gift. If you go on our Facebook, you can see everybody who was there. There were some that were sick and weren't able to be there. But the greatest gift was being with my kids and grandkids. Terry's kids. That was the greatest gift. Spending time. Now think about it, church. What is the greatest gift of coming to church other than worshiping our risen, risen Lord? It's spending time with each other. You're my brothers and sisters. And spending time with you, worshiping our Lord, is so pleasing in my very soul, in my heart. That's why I get to come to church. I love God. I love Jesus. I love the Holy Spirit. And I love experiencing them in our church. And when I say in our church, I'm talking about the building. But I love to experience it with our church, which is you, which is you. Guess what? You can't get that sitting at home on the couch. You can't get it. We had a great time yesterday just being together. Fireworks, all kinds, guns, you name it. Now in the north, they'll say, guns? You had guns? Some of us live in the country and we shoot guns. We have fun. God tells us as believers though in Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. It's not a command. It's not a command. But it's certainly a great message. And it says... And let us not consider, or let us consider one another. Let us consider one another. That means I need to consider Robert. I need to consider Heather. I need to consider uh, Terry. I need to c consider uh, Carol. And I'm so glad to see Ann. I'm so glad to see you here. God bless you, sister. I'm glad you're feeling better. I'm glad you're here. I truly, truly am. Uh, Lisa, uh, uh, Claude, Jesse. Uh, Ted, Beverly, on and on and on and on. Victor and uh, uh, his better half, <laughs> Ferris. <laughs> I'm terrible with names. I'm just trying to wrestle them off, okay? Uh, I had to check my driver's license to see who I am. But, but I'm serious. I love to be with you guys. Why? Because we're the church. We're the church. You can't get there if you're sitting at home in your chair. Jesus says, and the, the words of God are from Jesus, all right? Jesus is the word, John 1. We, we, don't, we don't mistake that, right? We know that. All right, so Jesus says in Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. 
There's a purpose for you being here. There's a purpose for me being here. We consider one another. I'm here for you. You're here for me. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Together, not separate. Consider assembling yourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much more as we see the day approaching. What does exhorting mean? Well, let's just back up a little bit. Over in verse 24, it says, let us consider one another. It's not about you. It's not about one person. It's about all of us collectively. In order that we may stir up the love and the good works that God has laid out for us. We are edifying. We're encouraging each other in love. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, exhorting one another is to strongly encourage one another. We're here to lift each other up in the Lord. As we see the day approaching, what day? The day that Christ is coming back? Because guess what? It could happen today. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen the next day. We don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen because Jesus said it's going to happen. So we're here to encourage one another. Hey, Jesus is coming back. And we're not going to have to fight these battles anymore. Because he wins our battles. He fights our battles. After each day passes, we get closer and closer to his return. After each day. And I don't want to miss one day without the Lord. I don't want to miss one day without the church, without you. Not one day, not one minute. We were talking not too long ago about uh, how the church is evolving and going along. We've got something almost every night. Almost every night. Then uh, somebody says, well, what night do you not have? And it's generally Thursday night we don't have anything going. That's probably the most common night that we don't have anything going Thursday night. Guess what? We got something planned for Thursday nights. Okay? There's not going to be a reason you can't be in church. Not as far as the church is concerned. Because we are here to, we're here for this community. Not just for you, but for the community. And we, we don't. We need things going on to give people the opportunity to come and know a little bit more about the Lord, to know the Lord. And so we do different things. But understand, these different things are not the church. These different things are ministries. It's just like Sister Heather, she's not the church, but when she's here with us, she is a part of the church. If she is by herself, then she is in her ministry which is a part of the church. It's not the church. It's the same way with people who are sitting at home watching this on TV. They're not the church. That is not the church. It's a part of the ministry of the church. We put a lot of money, a lot of effort into reaching all over the world, and we do reach all over the world. We have people that follow us in Africa, in India, in Scotland, in England, in Australia, and all over the United States. This little bitty church. But all that is a ministry of the church. You here today, that's the church. And when Heather goes back to her church, then she will be a part of her church, which is a part of our church. You see how it works? Sitting at home, watching it on TV is a part of our ministry that we put out for those who cannot make it to church. It is never God's intent for you to sit at home in your pajamas, half awake, half asleep, eating your breakfast while the word of God is being preached. While praise and worship is going on. How many people do you think that are at home when praise and worship, when a great song comes on on praise and worship, how many of you people think that they put down their lounge chair and stand up and sing praises? No. They don't do that. I would hope they would, but they don't do that. When I sit at home and I watch a lot of ministries because I love the word and I love to hear everybody's 
version, if you will, or opinion. All right. So I watch a lot of ministries. I like, I watch a lot of church. As a matter of fact, that's all that pretty much kind of all we ever do, except a couple of cop shows I like. But when I watch these guys and when I listen to these guys, I, I bow my head when we pray, but I don't get up and stand up and sing hallelujah. I don't get up and say, oh, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. I don't do that. I just watch it on TV. People who are at home going to church are doing the same thing. They're not in church. They're watching church. See, and there's a big difference. There's a big difference. But since two years ago, or a little over two years ago, when this COVID thing happened, and we never shut down and we won't shut down, when this COVID thing happened, we had to try to make church available, if you will, to those who had to stay at home. And I encourage people, if you did not feel comfortable coming here for health reasons or whatever, then stay at home and share it on TV and watch it on TV or your computer or your phone or whatever it is. But when that's over with, get in church, get back in church, become a part of the church. Many of our able brothers and sisters have lackadaisically, if that's a word, continue to do exactly what they're now used to, which is to sit at home and say, oh yeah, I'm going to go to church today. I'm going to watch it on the TV. It's not church. It's not church. I don't care which ministry you watch. I don't care which pastor you follow. You're not in church. You're not a part of the church. You're involved in a ministry of a church. There's a huge difference. When we go out on the 4th of July and hand out watermelon, nobody's in church, but they're getting part of the ministry of the church because we're introducing, if we can, and praying for whoever we can pray for, on and on and on. It's a ministry of the church. It's not the church. The church is here with believers brothers and sisters who are believers. You can't go to church on TV, sorry. Oh, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. What about over in the scriptures where it says where two or three are gathered, I'm in their midst. Well, I'm glad you asked about that. Because that's actually in Matthew 18, if you want to go there. Matthew 18, verses 18 through 20. Now, I'm not trying to bust anybody's chops about not being in church, but then again, I am, okay? Because not being in church is still not being in church. And I have read Matthew 18. Most of us look at it as verse 18, but I think we need, I believe it's, no, as 20, verse 20. But we need to look at what's going on here. So we're going we're gonna to go Matthew 18, verses 18 through 20. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that the, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything and they ask it will be done for them by the father in heaven for where two or three are gathered together in my name i am in the midst of them well let's just get together and have church just me and you that's not what the scripture is about it's not what that scripture is saying you know what that scripture is talking about that scripture is talking about if you've got a problem in the church, follow this now. If you read back up a little bit, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. If you've got a, a problem in the church, then you and another or a couple others, if you will, maybe the elders of the church, maybe the pastors of the church, maybe the leaders of the church, you get together and pray. And God will be with you to guide and direct you. That's what that scripture is talking about. It's not talking about, oh, well, I can have church just sitting in my truck with me and God. God is with you. 
and you can praise and worship and, and pray and, and or I mean, praise and worship and pray and talk to God and he'll talk to you. But that's not church, friend. That's spending time with God, which is a great thing. And you should do it. But where two or three are gathered and him in our midst does not mean that you're in church. When I go out and we did a visitation here recently to a family whose, uh, whose mom was passing, we weren't in church. And there were 15 people there, I guess, however many people were there. 15 people there, and Terry and I were there, and, and I was sharing with them some scriptures. I was praying with them, et cetera, et cetera. We weren't in church. What I do on the outside is a ministry of the church because it's what God's called me to do. There was far more than two or three there. There was a bunch of us there, a bunch of people there, people I didn't even know. And I was there to share Jesus with them. I was there to reinforce the fact that this lady who is taking her last breath as we speak is about to go to be with her Lord. It happens. It's the way that it works. But that's not in church. Some of those people didn't have a clue what I was even talking about. And I'm not trying to judge them in any way, shape, form, or fashion. But church, we have to understand, being in church means exactly that. It's being in church, being church with like believers, with brothers and sisters, doing what the church does. Everything else is a ministry of the church. Us reaching out to England, to Australia, to Africa, to India, that's a ministry of the church. Us reaching the people who are sitting in their lounge chairs this morning because they didn't want to get up and go to church. That is a ministry of the church. They're not the church. They're not even going to church. What is going to church? That means getting up, getting dressed, getting in your car and going to church. You can't do that sitting in your chair. I hope you're staying awake. We must understand God is always with us and he is there to help us and guide us and direct us in all things. And what that scripture is talking about is that God will be with you in prayer. If you need something answered, he will be there with you to help you work through it because that's his job. That's what God is. It says nothing, nothing in that scripture, nothing about being in church outside of the church nothing you're not in church outside the church now when i say outside the church i'm not talking about the building we know that it's outside of the body of believers well i don't quite understand that well good i'm glad you asked that too because we're going to talk about over in Ephesians. Let's go to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 1. And this should clear anything up for you. Ephesians 1. It's right after Galatians. Ephesians 1, starting at verse 22 and 23. Now, I'm going to skip around a little bit, so just stay with me, if you will. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. The whole purpose of these scriptures here is to tell you what the church is. All right? All right. Uh, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head, to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So the church, and this is very important to understand, the church is the body of believers, which is a symbolism of the body of Christ. All right? I hope, I hope you're with me. We're going to go a little bit deeper with that. Go over to 2 and 19. 2 and 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building 
being fitted together, grows into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you also are being built, in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. This is you. You are the body of Christ. You are the place where God lives. Not this building. This is, I was going to say brick and mortar, but there's no brick. This is, this is concrete and metal. And a little bit of wood. It's not the body of Christ. It's not representative of the body of Christ. It's a place where the body of Christ comes to worship. Chapter 4, Ephesians 4. Verse 11, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. You're the saints and the purpose of coming together is for the equipping of the ministry. In other words, what you receive here. It's what you are to take out there. That's our ministries. That's exactly what we do with our live stream service. We take the ministry here while we're here and we try to put it out there. You don't have to answer this and I don't think there is anyone here. But if there's anyone here that is not saved, this message is for you. Because the message here is for you to be equipped to become one of the saints, to become part of the church. You are not a part of the church if you are not a part of Christ. You are not. Oh, but I do go to church. It's a building, people. It's a building. You have to be a part of the body. And the body is the believers with Jesus alone as the head. Otherwise, you're just in a building. I forgot where I was at. You see, 411, 411 through 16. Let me find my spot again. 13, thank you very much. We go through this in Bible study all the time. Verse 13. All right, let me go back to 11. For the equipping of the saints, working for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, the edifying of the body of Christ, the lifting up, the encouraging of the believers. That's you and me. That's the reason that God equips us so that we can do that. Till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man or woman. God is perfecting you and me through the ministry, through the teaching, through the, the uh, equipping that he does by you and I attending church so that we can become perfect. I know, I know, I got a long way to go, all right? But what he started in me, he will bring to fruition. Ephesians 1 and 6. To the measure, look at this now, to the measure, not of another person, not of your pastor, not of a, a saintly person, not of somebody who is, oh man, that's a godly man there, let me tell you. No, no, no. We're being brought to perfection, being brought to the perfection, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, of Jesus, not somebody else. Oh, well, yeah, he's such an, uh, an awesome person. We all fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us. But you go to the church to be equipped to become perfect. To be perfected. How are you perfected? Through the teaching of the word, which is Jesus. Which is Jesus. 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Wind of doctrine. The doctrine, that is the word. People use, I was talking about, about this with a, a couple of guys this uh, Friday. There's so much doctrine out there. What do you follow? What is real? What is unreal? What is false? What is not? 
there's only one way to determine what you are to follow. And that is, as it tells us in John 14, Jesus says, And I will send the Holy Spirit to live in you and teach you all things I want you to know. So it's following Christ. It's letting Christ teach you. How do you do that? If you are not a part of the body of believers, you do not have Christ. Oh, well, I think Jesus talks to me. Well, you can think all you want. And he may be trying to talk to you to try to get your attention. But I guarantee you the blessings of God are not for you if you are not a child of God. They're not for you. Now, God can bless you however he wants to. He says, Esau, I hated. Jacob, I love. He says, I will favor who I want to favor. I will bless who I want to bless. God's God. He can do whatever he wants to do. But if you remember, he used Pharaoh so that he would be glorified. He says, Pharaoh, I raised you up for my glory, not yours. And he can raise up a sinner for, his, for God's glory and not the sinner's glory. He can use anything he wants to. I love it where over in um, uh, Proverbs it says, and he can use a nagging wife. Not that I have one. Not that I have one, but he can use one. He can use a nagging wife in order to get your attention. Okay, I'll go. Because guys, we're hard-headed. We don't want to submit to anybody. Oh, yeah, I'm a man. Wait till God humbles you. You'll be crying like a baby. Verse 15. No, 14. I'm going to finish 14. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about like the wind of every doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. Wow. It's out there, friend. Don't think it's not. But speaking the truth in love that may grow up in all things into him who is the head, who is Christ, for whom the whole body, the whole body, joined and knitted together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. You see, you cannot, you cannot grow in Christ unless you're tied in to the church. You don't come here to be seen. You don't come to any church. You shouldn't come here to be seen. You, couldn't, uh, you shouldn't be coming here to see. We come together to edify each other, to grow each other, to help each other, to encourage each other, to become more and more like the perfect man that walked this earth, which is Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. And you're called to do that. You're called to be here with like believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. You're not called to watch it on TV. Now, I understand, and I'm not judging anyone because that's God's job, but I understand that there are people who cannot be here for many different reasons. And that's what the ministry is for. But the, min the ministry is not for the lazy people who don't want to get up off their, excuse my French, butts, and get dressed and go to worship. That's not what the ministry's for. It is to reach the people who need to be reached that cannot get here. And I don't mean just here, I mean any church that teaches the Word of God. And when are we going to get that? Oh, but it's so much easier, right? To sit at home, it's so much easier. You miss the blessings. You miss the blessings, and we're going to talk about that. But first, let's go to 5. Chapter 5, verse 23. Chapter 5, verse 23. Ephesians. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. He is the Savior of the body. What body? 
the body of believers, you and me. He is our only Savior. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water of the word, by the word. See, husbands, you are to take control of the spiritual wellness and the spiritual leadership of your household, and you're to get up and make sure, and I know the wife generally does it, but you're to get up and make sure that your wife and your family is loaded in the car and drove, driven to church, drove into church, driven to church so that they can worship the Lord. It is your responsibility, guys. It's not your wife's responsibility, but though the women, because the guys would not pick up the slack, the women have picked up the slack, and that's why there's therefore more women in church than there is guys almost in any congregation. Why? Because we're men. <laughs> Give me a break. Men, it is our responsibility, and we will answer to God for not having our families in church. And I am guilty of that. Growing up, all the way until the Lord got a hold of me and yanked a knot in my head, I would not go to church. I even told my buddy, which you guys have heard this before, what do I need God for? I don't need God. Until I needed God. And when I needed God, I really needed God. And I messed up and I did not bring my kids up in church like I should have. And it is my bad. And I will answer to God for that. Not you. I'll answer to God for that. And trust me, I ask for his forgiveness. Over and over and over. Not that he hasn't forgiven me because he has. Because he is a forgiving, loving God. But because I realize where I messed up. And so the word today is so you don't mess up anymore. Get up off your fanny and go to church and take your family to church. It is your responsibility. Verse 26, that he may sanctify and cleanse with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church having not a spot or a wrinkle or any such thing, that, <clears throat> that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love your own wives as your own bodies. <clears throat> he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one who ever hated his own flesh nourished or cher or, but nourished and cherished it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bone. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and they shall join together with his wife and the two shall become one. This is the great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. I speak concerning Christ in the church. The great mystery is that this was not revealed in the Old Testament because there was no church in the Old Testament. The mystery is, is that, guys, you don't go to somebody else to get your family straight. You don't go and worship in a, in a, uh, under the leadership of someone else. You don't come and worship under me. You come and worship under Christ. And you bring your family to church to worship Christ. And you can't do that sitting at home. As far as the ministry of live streaming, it is a ministry that is very important to this church because there are many people who cannot come to church, who cannot do it for whatever reasons, many reasons, many legitimate, perfectly good reasons. But the ones who are just simply sitting at home because they don't want to get up, they're missing out. So what are they missing? Well, I don't need to go to church. There's just a bunch of hypocrites there. Well, there's hypocrites out there too. But at least you come to church to try to learn how to not be a hypocrite, right? Sure. You can sit at home, and as you might think, 
and be at church. But you're not at church. You cannot sit at home and be the church. Be the church. You can't sit at home and be the church. The church is not you. The church is the body of believers. See, you're like a fingernail on the little toe of the left foot. And you're just the end of it. You're not the church. You're a part of the church. You can't sit at home and be involved as the church is involved with itself in the community. You cannot sit at home and feel the presence of the Spirit as a collective body of Christ as we worship. You can't feel that at home. You cannot sit at home and get the love or even be the love that Christ has caused us to be to his body. You cannot sit at home and get the full message of the word. Why? I mean, how often do you, does your phone ring? My phone rings constantly. When I come in here, I leave it out there for a reason. Because I guarantee you there will be missed calls and texts and so on and so forth on my phone. It's always on, and that's fine. But there are times I don't need my phone with me, believe it or not. And we just don't leave home without it anymore, do we? Oh, where's my phone? Where's my phone? I got to drive back 40 miles to get my phone. I got to have my phone. We're that attached to it. We are. So when you're sitting in your chair at home, rocking back and forth, eating your breakfast, whatever, as your wife is talking to you about what you're going to do that afternoon, how all your chores you got to do, and your phone rings and there's two or three different people. Oh, hey, buddy, will you call so-and-so and tell them that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so you start making phone calls. You've missed the whole message. Oh, I'm going to sit at home and watch church. No, you're not. Most likely, you're going to be interrupted time and time again. And you're going to miss the message. Or you might just fall asleep. Anybody ever slept all night and then get up and get in your easy chair and go back to sleep? I certainly have. It's crazy. Usually I get up and I'm ready to go. But some days I get up and I like to watch the news in the morning. I like to watch about an hour of news, maybe a little more. And I'll be sitting there on the, on the uh, couch or the chair or whatever, and all of a sudden I'm going, I'm falling asleep. I just woke up. What's up with that? It's just what we do. It's just what we do. When we get relaxed, we generally go to sleep. So you get relaxed in your nice, easy chair while you're watching church, while you're going to church. And you just drift off to sleep. It happens. Again, I'm not judging people, but I'm, I want you to understand, you're missing part of being the church. You're missing it. You cannot sit at home in your easy chair and be blessed. Be blessed by the corporate worship. Your brothers and sisters coming together and worshiping and praying. You miss that blessing because you're not a part of it. You're not a part of it. Here's one. You cannot, sitting in your easy chair, be the blessing to the church. You see, you're a blessing being here. Oh, yeah, I know. You just want my money. I don't want your money. Okay? Our church is financially sound. Always has been. We have never not been financially sound. We've been short a little while, or, or close to not having as much as we thought we should, but we have never, ever not been we've never lacked anything never in 11 years we've never lacked because God provides God provides and we look to him for provision we don't look for you for provision if if it is in your heart that you're giving begrudgingly scripture says and I back up with scripture please keep your money Okay, because if you're giving it begrudgingly or if you're giving it because you think that you owe God, keep it. 
Scripture says, give from a cheerful heart. Give from your means, not from what you, from what you have, not from what you don't have. Never put your tithing and offerings on a credit card. We don't do that here. Don't put it on a credit card. That puts you in debt. God says don't be in debt. If there's any reason other than the cheerful heart that you're giving your tithes and offerings, God, in my opinion, okay, I'm not God, so I'm not, boy, I'm not judging, but I believe that God will not bless that. We have always given with a cheerful heart, eagerly given, and our church has been financially sound since day one. And it still is. Come to our business meetings, you will see. I, I announce our financial standings every time we have a business meeting. I let people know where we are at. And that's not anybody else's business. I just want our congregation to know where we're at financially. And let me tell you, we are financially sound. Because we're good stewards of God's money. Not your money, not my money, but God's money. Because that's how he directs us to be. You cannot be the church watching it on TV. You're missing out so much, so much of the blessings that are available. Our live stream is a ministry of the church. It is not the church. It is a benefit for those who cannot get here for whatever reason, but it is never and never intended to be a substitute for going to church. It is the ministry of the church. It is a ministry of the church. So what does scripture say about how we are to be the church? I'm glad you asked. Let's go to our scripture for the day. Go to Acts, Acts 2, and you're going to see some things, because some of you have asked me some things over the years, and you're going to see some things right here as to why I, and if you will, I direct the church as I direct the church, because that's my spot, that's my responsibility. You, you realize my responsibility to this church, to you, to the body of believers that go to this congregation, is your spiritual well-being. That's my responsibility. I don't owe you anything else, nor am I planning to give you anything else, okay? But your spiritual well-being is my ministry to pour out on you as much as I possibly can through the teaching of the Word. All right, Acts 2, starting at verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now there is a calling right there for me to let you know each and every Sunday, if you are not a child of the Most High God, you do not have the Holy Spirit. You cannot have the Holy Spirit, which is God. He's the third member of the triune God. So therefore, you do not have God. Now, you say, well, what is the baptism? The baptism we did last Sunday, which is the baptism in water, it's a water baptism, it is not the true baptism. The true baptism is you receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your very spirit. This is simply a public proclamation, which we did last Sunday, to show you what somebody else has already done, which is to receive Jesus as Lord. That is my job, for you to understand that you need to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Otherwise, you will not be in heaven. It has nothing to do with water. That is simply showing everybody else what you've already done. We are being baptized. Jesus tells us to do this in remembrance of him, which we're going to do another act today as in remembrance of him, which I didn't include in what you cannot share in a minute ago for a, for a purpose. But we're going to, I'm going to talk about it in just a second. You are called to be baptized as Christ was to be baptized by immersion. Not sprinkling, but it's okay if you can't get down in the water. If you really want to get down in the water, I can get you in the water. All right? All right, I can get you underneath. 
but it's simply a public proclamation of what you've already done in your heart, which is my job, which is to try to lead you to understanding how much God loves you and that he wants you as a part of his kingdom. But if you do not get baptized in the Holy Spirit and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, you will not get into the gates of heaven. Bam! It's that simple. It's not difficult. Jesus said over in John 3, 9, uh, 3, 7, I think it is. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. You must be reborn. You must be reborn. And you're reborn by the water and the spirit. The water is the washing of the word. The spirit is the Holy Spirit of God. You must be reborn. Or else you cannot see the kingdom of heaven and you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus don't lie. It's just that simple, friend. Verse 39. For the promise is to you and to your children. To you and to your children. Hello, dads. To you and your children. You want your children in heaven? Man, I wish I could backtrack. I can't. But I sure wish I could. For the promises to you and to your children. And my kids are saved. I believe totally that they are. But again, that's between them and God. All right? It's not between me, them, and God. But it's between them and God. For the promises to you and to your children and to all who are afar off. That doesn't mean all who are afar off like over in England or India or something like that. Who are far off from God. You can be sitting right here and you can be afar from God. Okay? As many as the Lord our God will call. Because you do not come, according to the uh, Gospel of John, you do not come to God unless you are called by God. It's not something you do. It's what God does. Why does he do it? Because he loves you. That's why. Verse 40. And with many other words and testified and exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. You think we got a perverse generation going around here? Yeah, we do. Well, you know what? They did over 2,000 years ago, too. It ain't nothing new. Nothing new under the sun. Then those who gladly received the word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. The apostles' doctrine. Now, the apostles' doctrine. The New Testament was written by, with the exception of Luke, they were written by apostles. Now, James and Jude were brothers of Christ. They weren't apostles. But the apostles wrote the, three, the four gospels. With the exception of Luke, he was not an apostle, but he was, uh, well, actually, Mark wasn't an apostle either. Mark was a, uh, a nephew of Barnabas, not an apostle, but the apostles gave us the words. They were appointed by God. Paul, who wrote most of the Bible, he was appointed by God. You can look over in Acts 1, I think it's 16. You can see the criteria of being an apostle. There, Paul, other than Christ, who is still the, the last apostle, Paul was the last apostle. There are no other apostles, all right, because there's a certain criteria they have to meet in order to be an apostle. And Paul was the last one appointed by Jesus, who had a face-to-face -face contact or appointment, if you will, with Christ. But by the apostles' doctrine who are teaching during this time, all right, look at this next one, and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. We are a praying church. We pray. Now I'm going to share this with you too. Fellowship in the breaking, in the breaking of bread. We eat. We love to eat. I love to eat. But what is the purpose of our fellowship luncheon? The breaking of bread with each other. It is to fellowship with one another. Over a meal. If you look when Jesus fellowshiped with his disciples. 99% of the time they were sitting around somewhere eating. Because it's a big part of it. I was told or asked one time. Well do we have to have our luncheon every month? Yeah. We do. Why? Because the purpose of it is, is to fellowship with one another. After, at every 
service on the next week is our fellowship luncheon. What is the purpose of it? And I will say this. It doesn't matter if you brought anything or not. Please stay in fellowship with us. Because that's the purpose. I, now I will if you invite me. But I'm not coming to your house to eat with you. If you invite me, I probably will. I ain't turned anybody down yet. But I don't eat with you on a regular basis. I don't fellowship with you on a regular basis outside the church because I don't have the opportunity to. You got a busy life, I got a busy life. But when it's time to come together in fellowship as the church did in the very, very beginning, we try to do that. And we encourage people to stay and eat so that we can sit in fellowship with them. What is fellowship with? What is, fe what is fellowship? Spending time. You fellowship with God, what does that mean? You spend time with God. That's all it is. You don't have to eat. You can pray. You can read the Word. You can listen to a ministry. You can do all sorts of things. But again, that's still not the church. To be the church, you have to come together as a congregation and fellowship with one another like believers. In the breaking of the bread was the tradition there. And we're going to see that they continued that. So therefore, we continue it, the breaking of the bread, and in prayer. We have our corporate prayer on the fourth Sunday. I think it's the fourth Sunday of every week. We do our corporate prayer. We come together and pray. We pray at the beginning of the service. We pray in the middle of the service. We pray before we go to the children's church. We pray, we pray, we pray, we pray, we pray. Because we're a praying church. We have to be. We have to be a praying congregation. Why? Because we're calling on God to bless us. Don't you want God's blessings? Well, sure we do. Well, how do you get them? Oh, well, I watched a, a, a ministry the other day. God's going to bless me, you know, because I did good. That's you. Oh, well, I went to church two or three times. Well, God's certainly going to bless me for going to church. Well, I went to church on Easter and Christmas. Come on. Come on. God wants you with him all the time. Not just two hours a week. How many of us spend time with God? And don't raise your hands or anything. But how many of us spend time with God every day? Every day. I know my wife does. She knows that I do. How many of you spend time with God every day? Five minutes, ten minutes? And that might be stretching it. Oh, well, every time we eat, we pray. Look, you're praying to get your food blessed so you don't get sick. All right, that's what you're praying about. You're not praying to talk with God. You're not praying to spend time with God. That's what I'm talking about. Do we do it two or three minutes, maybe? Maybe. Well, I spent an hour with him yesterday, so I guess I'm good for about a week, right? How much time do you spend with God? He wants, you, he wants to be involved with you as to where you need to stop and get gas this afternoon, if you need to. He wants to be involved with you as to are you, where are you going to go and eat? He wants to be involved with you as to what you're going to watch on TV this afternoon. He wants to be involved with every moment of your life. I know we all mess up, and he knows it too. But invite him into your life and see the blessings that he will pour out on you. But you got to do it. You can't do it here on Sunday. That's not the reason we're here on Sunday. We're here to worship Him on Sunday. We're here to worship Him on Sunday. And you can't do that sitting at home in your chair. You can't do it. He wants to bless you, bless you beyond your wildest dreams. He says, no mind is here, no, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. No eye has seen, no ear has heard the blessings that God has in store for you. Then fear came, verse 43. 
Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Through the apostles. Now all who believe were together in all things in common. Now understand this, and I want to explain this to you after we read verse 45. And sold their possessions and good, and divided them among all as anyone needed. Understand this, and please, 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 especially if you're a senior citizen, understand this. I explained to you a minute ago that our church is financially sound. We do not want your goods. We do not want your money. We do not want your car, your truck, your house, whatever. All right? What they are doing and what happened here was this was a new thing, if you will, and it was called the way. And they really didn't know much about what they were doing other than just simply following the leadership of the apostles. And there were many, 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 many people who were desperately poor who wanted to be a part of the way or a part of the church. And so the people came together tithes and offerings and offered it to the church so that the church could help other people. You will have, especially, again, senior citizens, because you're many times you're a fool, and I'm not trying to point fingers or anything, but many times you will have churches, if you will, ministers, pastors, whatever they want to call themselves, and they would say, oh yeah, you give me your money and God will bless you. No. You give God every penny you have does not mean he's going to give you more money. Okay? Has nothing to do with money. You give God your blessings and God will bless you. Press down, shake him. Pour it into your lap beyond what you can handle. Give and it shall be given unto you. It does not mean your money. So do not let somebody come into you and say, yeah, if you will send me $1,000 or $100, God will give you $1,000. That is not true. That is a bald-faced lie. Oh, yeah, you give $30 and God will, will uh, come back and, and uh, uh, give you 30, 60, 90 fold. That is not in Scripture. 30, 60, 90 fold is, but it is not talking about money. It is talking about blessings. Do not be fooled. God says, give from your means. Give from what you have, not what you don't have. Do you think God wants you to not have lights in your house? Do you think God does not want you to have water in your, coming out of your spigot? Do you think God does not want your kids to be fed? Not at all. He gave you those things to take care of. You give from your heart whatever God puts on your heart to give. That is your tithes. Anything over and above that is called an offering. But you give from a cheerful heart. You give because you want to give, not because you're ha you have to give or you feel guilty in giving. That is not blessed, so please don't do it. These people sold everything so that they could support a, a new startup, if you will, or a new way that was unknown to other people. And so they had to raise some money, and they raised it quick, so they came together. Now, a lot of people take that, and we've seen them over and over and over again. We've seen these cults that start up out there. Yeah, this is the leader, not me. I'm Jesus, so I'm the new Jesus, and so you got to give me all your stuff, especially your women and your kids, if you know what I'm getting at. Okay? That is not God's intent ever, 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 ever. It is not God's intent for you to give everything away and, and give it to the church. Now, I know there's a scripture that says where the, the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he says, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, give up everything. Go sell it. Give it to the poor. And then follow the Ten Commandments. Jesus was not telling him to sell everything. He was telling him to, to quit letting his possessions be his God. That's what he was trying to tell him. And to follow the commandments of God. God never wants you to be in poverty. He, he wants you to prosper. What, what is it? Um, oh, I know you know the scripture. And I can't think of how it goes off the top of my head. Uh, he wants you to prosper. And, and he has a plan for you. Not to harm you, but to... How's it go? Uh, how's it go? <laughs> okay. All right. Who knows Jeremiah 29, 11 off the top of the head?
There you go. That's what God's plan is for your life. I couldn't remember all the words because my mind is somewhere else already. But you see, that's what God's plan is for you, to prosper you and to give you a hope, not to take everything from you. You think he needs your stuff? <laughs> Guess what? It ain't your stuff anyway. It's his stuff. So please understand that. Verse 46. So continuing daily on one accord. On one accord, friend, means like believers. United in faith in Christ. That's what we're supposed to be as a church. In the temple, in the church, all right? The breaking of bread from house to house. In other words, your house, your house, your house, your house, my house, we're still of one accord. We're in different houses, but we're all still one accord, all right? From house to house, and they ate food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God. This is where it's all about. This is what the church does. It praises God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. This is the church. It's individuals on one accord, praising God, sharing the gospel so that God's kingdom will be built. But it's not in this building. It's out there. In this building, we are here to worship him and praise him. This is where we do our corporate worship. This is where we come together and thank God for all that he does do for us. And then we take it out there. You miss out on that if you're sitting at home in your easy chair. You don't get the blessing. You don't get the blessing, friend. Now, what is the... Where did it, there it is. What is the one thing that I left off a while ago? You cannot partake of what we call the elements. You cannot celebrate the Lord's Supper as he commanded us to do from your easy chair at home. This always just goes right to my heart every time I, I do this. Jesus, on the night before he was going to die, hours before he was going to be led to the cross and beaten beyond recognition as a human being, be nailed to the cross, die, be separated from the Father for three hours, he had his disciples on his heart. Not himself. Not himself. He wasn't sitting there going, oh, poor me. You guys come here and give me some old poor babies. That's not what he's doing. He says, I want you to remember me by partaking of these elements. And he says, this is the last time that I will celebrate the Lord's Supper with you. Because I'm fixing to go die. But I want you to celebrate the Lord's Supper on a continuous basis. This is the second decree that he told us to remember to do on a constant basis in remembrance of him. We do two things. We baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we partake in the Lord's Supper. You cannot do this at home. Now you can partake, but you cannot have that corporate feel that you can have if you're here with us today. You can take of your saltine crackers and your water or whatever you want to do at home. It's just not the same. It's not the same. No matter why, how you try to paint it, it's not the same. And so right now, for a new year, I want to partake, and this, the Lord put this on my heart uh, yesterday, I think it was, or day before. It's not our normal time, I know. I had many people say, well, why are we doing it? Why are we doing it? I said, you'll have to wait. Okay? We're doing it because today is the first day of a new year. Today, in my heart, is a day that we should recommit ourselves, at least for a while, I hope, recommit ourselves to the Lord. Not to be rebaptized, not to be rededicated, to recommit ourselves to serving the Lord. How do you serve the Lord? By being the church. 
You serve it through the church, through the ministries of the church. You be the church. And so today, if you will just abide with me for a moment, I want to pray as Jesus prayed, and I want to partake in the elements. So be careful opening it up. If you pull the little, the top one first, you can get the wafer out. And don't open the juice yet because you might spill it in the meantime. We'll open it in just a second. Everybody got their wafer out? <sighs> On the night before Jesus died for me, and before Jesus died for you, he took his guys unto himself. And he took the bread. And he gave thanks. And he said, this is the bread. This is my body given for you. Eat of this. Take this in remembrance of me. And after they had eaten, he took the cup. Be careful with it, please. He took the cup. And he lifted it up. And he said, This is my blood poured out for you. Poured out for you. Poured out for you. Take this in remembrance of me. Every time I do that and lead you in it, it goes directly to my heart because I think of all the times that I did things that weren't for his glory. But I know that he loves me because he said, this is my blood, would he pour it out for you? Take this in remembrance of me. And so I partake because of what he did. Certainly not anything I've ever done. We say we don't deny Christ. But if we don't join together as the body of Christ... At least once a week. At least once a week. Many of us are here almost seven days a week. But if we don't do it at least once a week, if we can't come together for two hours, how can we partake of the elements and say we're doing it in remembrance of him? If we are the body of, the, of Christ and he is the head, what part of the body is missing when you stay at home? What part of the body is missing when you stay at home? When you just don't feel like being in church. You just don't feel like getting up and going. When you simply deny Christ the blessing of your presence. The blessing of your presence. And you deny his body, brothers and sisters, your presence. You are a blessing to this church, to this congregation, not the building, to the congregation. Every time you show up, you are the blessing. And every time you bring the blessing, you will be blessed. You can't outgive God. I don't care what you, you can try it. As a matter of fact, he says, try it. You cannot outgive God. Now, outgiving God does not mean giving your money. It means giving your blessings, your presence 
being here with your brothers and sisters who worship God, who are here to worship God, who are here to love God, who are here to be loved by God. Because God is here. God is here. When this happens, when you don't show up because you don't feel like going to church, you lose the blessing. We all want God's blessings. So I pray this year, this year will be one of recommitment. Recommitment to being the church God has called you to be. Yes, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And we could use more workers. Jesus says the fields are vast and the workers are few. We need you. But if you don't want to be a part of it, we'll still be here for you. Because Christ is here for us. But if you want to be blessed, be a blessing. How simple is that? It's very simple. Be an active part of the body of Christ. Be the church. Be the church. You can't do that at home. You can't do it at home. I pray each and every person here today. Go ahead and come up, sister. I pray each and every person here today knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And if you don't, if you don't, then it is a time of commitment, not recommitment, a time of commitment. You cannot know the love that God has for you unless you have God loving you and unless you love God. You cannot know it. You don't know that you don't even know. But I can attest to you as a testimony when I realized, and you're talking about a hard headed feller. But when God finally says, You're mine. And I said, Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. My life has changed. And it has changed. For a life I never knew could even exist. As a matter of fact, I even denied it could. But what a blessing to be a child of the Most High God. What a blessing. So if that's you today, and you have not received Jesus as Lord and Savior, we say it kind of nonchalantly, yes, just call on the name of Jesus. But here's the deal. You can call on the name of Jesus... Oh, yeah, now I'm saved. No, you have to know Jesus in your heart. Jesus knows your heart. And if you're doing it out of an act of of, uh, anything other than total 100% submission to him, 100%, that means, yes, on Sunday, guess what? I get to go to church. I get to go and worship. Not, oh, gosh, I think I'll just stay home because it's cowboys at noon. Or whatever. It doesn't matter. The point is simply this. If you don't go for the right reason, why would you ever expect God to welcome you into his kingdom? He said the the road is narrow that leads to the gates of heaven. And when he said that, he was simply taking this. I have to be your God. Not the TV. Not your money, not your work, not your job, not your wife, not your kids, not your grandkids. I have to be your God. The first commandment God gave us was, Thou shalt not have any other God before me. That means nothing else. Nothing before him. But yet we sit in our chairs at home and think we're in church. You're not. You're not in church. In order to be in church, I got to be with Robert and Jenny. I have to be with Robert and Jenny. Okay? We're three or more gathered. I'm in their midst. But there's more here than that. That scripture that I I shared with you over in Matthew 18 is about 
me and Robert and Jenny and Terry and whomever else coming together and praying for God's answers. That's what that scripture is about. That happens in church. It happens in church. Be the church. Make a commitment this year to be the church. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, if there is anybody here today who does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, then they're not a part of the church. It doesn't matter how much they've read their Bible. It doesn't matter how much they've prayed. It doesn't matter how much that they uh, said, oh yeah, I believe, I believe, I believe. They have to have Christ in their life. They have to be in the life of Christ in order to be the church. And they have to have the church around them in order to continue to grow as God calls us to grow in the likeness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I pray that you have received Jesus as Lord and Savior. You must mean it in your heart. If you have not, mean it in your heart and simply repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I give you full submission to your gospel, to you, to your sovereignty over my life. Lead me and guide me and direct me that someday I may see and enter the gates of heaven and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Lead me, Lord, that I may serve you from this day forward, especially from this day forward. It is a new year, and I make a commitment to you, Lord, that I shall serve you as much as you direct me to do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you did on the cross. Thank you for coming down off the cross. Thank you for coming to live again. And ascending to the Father and seated next to the Father at his right hand. And now you are interceding for me. Because I have submitted to you. And now I am a child of the Most High God. And I can look forward to an eternal life with you. From this day forward. Lead God and direct for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. All right. If anybody needs prayer whatsoever for anything, let us pray for you.